Hello guys, Winston here. I've been working on something for the past month that I am kinda proud of. And you could probably tell if you've been stalking me on Instagram, I've been uncharacteristically secretive about this project, and that usually means I'm both uncertain it'll work and simultaneously really really hoping it'll be super freaking awesome. And this is one of those times I think I succeeded. I want to introduce you to this, the Carbide Cruiser, an aluminum longboard deck machined entirely on a Shapeoko XL. It's the culmination of hours of CAD and CAM work, days of machining, and a heck of a lot of planning. It's a testament to what's possible with a good machining recipe that's properly calibrated for a desktop CNC and a really healthy amount of patience. This project was a massive undertaking, and there are way too many details to fit in one video. This video is meant to be a primer for a much larger series rolling out on the Carbide 3D channel, where I have the freedom to deep dive each of the design and manufacturing phases I went through to make this thing, the first episode of which is out now. And even as I edit this video, I'm working on design and process improvements for a second longboard, so I just wanted to give you a heads up on all that. What you're seeing today, it's gonna get even better. This is just a preview of what's to come. The inspiration for this project came from two places, the machinist world and the maker world. On one end of the spectrum, there's Daytron, manufacturer of some really sexy and capable CNCs that are way above my price range. They have a part that they sometimes run at trade shows, which is this really eye-catching aluminum longboard. On the other end of the spectrum, you have some super creative people like Paul Jackman thinking out of the box and making cool things like pallet wood penny boards. I've always wanted to be in the space between these two groups, and seeing these two projects got me thinking. Could I make my own skateboard, and do it in a way that was unique and original while also pushing myself outside my comfort zone? The latter was obviously going to happen, because if I could make a skateboard I'd have to ride it, and I don't know how to ride a skateboard. But what about the former? I knew I wanted a design that was first and foremost distinct from the Daytron board to avoid any comparisons. That thing is a showpiece that demonstrates a bunch of uber-precise machining operations and maximizes surface area to show off the quality of their cuts. But in some ways I find it to be quite German, that is to say, so full of technical features that it lacks soul. So for me, the shape had to be different, and the use of a hex pattern was also out of the question. In my quote-unquote research, I'd purchased a dirt-cheap plastic penny board from China, my initial expectation was that I'd loosely copy the form factor like Paul Jackman did and maybe recycle the trucks and wheels. I'd replicate the footprint of the penny board, apply my own design aesthetic, and also include the kicktail because I felt that adding that third dimension would really set my board apart. But as soon as I brought it into work to do some reverse engineering, Rob started size shaming me. He wanted me to quite literally go big or go home. And so my design grew to completely fill the work area of the Shapeoko XL. It evolved from a tiny penny board to something that could be reasonably considered a longboard. The deck would be 31 inches long, and with a kicktail it would grow to 34 inches. The target width was just under 8 inches to make sourcing my stock material easier. On the top of the deck I would inlay grip tape in the pattern of my logo. For me, leveraging multiple materials and colors and textures was important. This was supposed to be a design and digital fabrication showcase, not specifically aluminum machining porn like Daytron's longboard. On the bottom, I designed around the Carbide 3D logo. But in the space around it, I had two conflicting priorities. On the one hand, I wanted to remove material to lighten up the deck. But I also knew I needed some areas with more meat, so to speak. Resistance to bending comes from thickness, so I knew I needed a good amount of mass that was spread out vertically. I decided on a radially repeating pattern of lines to extrude outwards as ribs. Not only would these provide strength, it would also help visually occupy some of the space around the logo. This design in particular provides a load path that can be tailored to provide a certain amount of flexure in the board. I ran a really basic FEA which I know is grossly oversimplified and represents an unrealistic loading case, but it still illustrates my point. You can see that stresses are concentrated on the top skin of the deck and the bottom of the ribs. Bending stresses always appear at the furthest point from a part's neutral axis. That's why I-beams keep all their mass as far from the middle as possible. So by adjusting the size and thickness and spacing of my ribs, I could easily dial in a desired level of rigidity. With that design laid out, I went into cam mode. The strategy for this part, which I'm massively glossing over, is to rough everything out adaptively, then clean up everything with a combination of contour, pocket, and 3D finishing toolpaths. The biggest thing to be aware of is where you have stock to leave and how to approach your part in a controlled manner. If, for example, you're using a contour toolpath to clean up a wall, but you have axial stock to leave from the prior adaptive toolpath, when your cutter reaches the final step down, it's going to be fighting a lot more material. Or, let's say you want to use a pocket toolpath and clean up your floor first, if your cutter runs into radial stock to leave, then that's going to cause a lot of lateral loading. 
On a desktop machine, that's going to cause deflection and affect surface finish. Your swirl marks will be different, you'll have noticeable lines on your walls. Learning to work around your machine limitations and come out with a good looking part is a matter of diligently applying some best practices to your tool padding. Like, don't let wall finishing contours touch your floor, and don't let floor finishing contours touch your walls. Beyond that, most of the techniques I'm employing here are ones I've used before. Pins for indexing two-sided parts, quick and dirty locating fixtures, etc, etc. If you really want to get into the details with this longboard, I'll be walking through my entire journey with this project in a new series on the Carbide 3D channel, so go check that out. But in the meantime, let's talk about how the actual machining went. Adaptive clearing was the workhorse toolpath of this project. My basic aluminum roughing recipe is 75 thou depth of cut, 25 thou optimal, 18,000 RPM, chip load of 2 thou. And while that worked, it was also really loud, and it was also closer to the limits of my machine rigidity than I would have liked. So after the first hour or two of really pushing my machine, I backed off my depth of cut by about 10 thou. The real driver of time here is how many step downs you need to take, because each layer takes 20 minutes or more to get through. So picking a step down that nearly evenly divides your total depth of cut without a remainder is in your best interests. For example, if you're machining down 5 sixteenths of an inch in 0.06 inch increments, then your last step down is only going to be 12 thou deep, but it's going to take as long as any other layer. That's a massive waste of time, and if you just step it up a little and cut in 63 thou increments, you'll cut your machining time by 16% by eliminating a toolpath layer. Figuring out how to achieve a consistent surface finish was another challenge. Because the shape Oko is primarily deflection limited, you have to be really aware of your tool pressure. If you're using a pocket toolpath for finishing, you have to make sure that the material you're machining through is the same thickness throughout, otherwise you'll get different machining marks. Even though achieving a mirror surface finish on a Shapeoko is nearly impossible, you can still make a good looking part by ensuring your surface finish and tooling marks are at the very least consistent. That is, unless of course you're just going to nuke the thing with a bead blast or powder coat later. But here, I really want to show off the evidence of machining. I want people to note that I made this myself on a desktop CNC machine. I take pride in that. A lot of people look at desktop CNC routers and dismiss them because they're not large and heavy like a Haas or even a Tormach. Where's your beefed up Z-axis? Where's your coolant system? You haven't upgraded to a 2.2 kilowatt spindle yet? I get these questions a lot, but if you're smart about how you work, these machines, even stock, can do more than you expect. I'm running 18,000 RPM in aluminum, dry. My workpiece, after hours of machining, is body temperature. And that's probably only because of the router exhaust blowing down on this part warming it up. My trim router made this pile of chips on one set of brushes. My primary roughing end mill was a 1 quarter inch single flute standard ZRN coating. My air blast system, a hydroponic air pump that I picked up off Amazon for under $50. How do I keep my V-wheels clean? A hacked dust shoe and a toothbrush. Nothing I'm doing is particularly special or exotic, it just requires some imagination and patience. And that's really what I wanted to get across in this video, that something like this is achievable by almost anyone. The CNC machine you might primarily think of as a woodworking companion is actually versatile enough to let you explore design ideas in metal. Big ideas, bigger than what some industrial grade machining centers can accommodate. After hours of work, I finally ended up with the prototype you see here. I paired it with matte black trucks for a kind of shape oko theme and green wheels, though sadly I couldn't find any in carbide 3D green. I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever made and it's not even done yet. I still have to anodize it and apply grip tape but those tasks will all be done in the next few weeks. I'd love for you to be able to check out the finished project in person, and I'm planning on bringing it to Bay Area Maker Faire with me, so if you're going to be there, come stalk me. I won't be there in any official capacity, but chances are I'll be lurking around the content creator stage. For those of you who want to learn more about what went into making this longboard, I'm going to be doing an in-depth series on the Carbide 3D channel where I'll talk about everything from the sourcing and cost of the aluminum used in this project, to specific CAD CAM strategies, to finding an anodizing vendor, and more. That's going to be rolling out over the next few weeks, so go give the Carbide 3D channel a sub if you're interested. I want to thank you all very much for watching, I hope I've provided you a bit of inspiration to go and attack some more ambitious projects in your workshop, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects.